I'm going to talk to you today about 12 problems for post-trib rapture believers. Now, I have this thing typed out. Uh, one of the first times ever I'm going to be doing this. It's going to be available as a PDF over on my website, kingjamesvideoministries.com, in the free downloads section. I'm going to be posting links to it down in the description box. But I'm going to read through this thing here, and I'm going to show you 12 problems that post-trib rapture believers, those that believe the body of Christ has to go through this coming time period of God's judgment on the earth, they believe that Christians go through either the whole seven years or three and a half years, whichever one you are. The Bible does not teach either one of those systems. Okay, The Bible teaches that the body of Christ is going to be leaving before it begins. And I'm going to show you 12 problems if you want to be a post-tribber. Problem number one, peace from God. Romans chapter 1 verse 7 says, To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord gives all Christians peace. Every single one of the Pauline epistles begins with this promise of peace for a saved Christian. See also 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 3, 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 2, Galatians chapter 1 verse 3, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 2, Philippians chapter 1 verse 2, Colossians chapter 1 verse 2, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 1, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 2, 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 2, 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 2, Titus chapter 1 verse 4, and Philemon chapter 1 verse 3. This promise of peace from God stops when you get to the book of Hebrews. Why? Book of Hebrews. wonder who that could be written to. Hmm. Revelation chapter 6 verses 3 and 4 says, And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. Please notice that the he in verse 3 is a reference to the Lamb, who is Jesus Christ. Read Revelation chapter 5 for proof of that. Okay? So here's the problem with the first one. Problem number one. Paul writes to Christians and promises, promises us peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Yet in Revelation chapter 6 verse 4, it shows that Jesus, the Lamb, opens a seal which takes peace from the earth. So if you're a post-tribber, which one is it? Did Paul lie about peace coming from God? Or are the Christians uh, gone before Revelation chapter 6 takes place? Christians are gone before Revelation chapter 6 first takes place. Look at the uh, group of 24 elders and then a multitude of angels in heaven that are redeemed out of the blood of the Lamb from every people, tongue, kindred, nation. They're in chapter 5 before Revelation chapter 6 takes place. Number two, problem number two, the mark of the beast versus eternal security. There's another one that they can't handle. Revelation 14 verses 9 through 11 says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment, torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Notice there are no exceptions to this judgment. Quote, any man, and quote, whosoever worship the, worships the beast and takes his mark will face God's wrath. But what about a Christian? Very important question. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 12 through 14 says, That we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 30 says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed until the day of redemption. God seals a Christian and promises them eternal life. He saves us. We cannot save ourselves. But here's the problem if you're a post-tribber. Revelation 14 verses 9 through 11 says that anyone who worships the beast and takes the mark will face God's wrath. And that begins at the beginning, by the way, too, of this time period. But Ephesians 1 13 and 4 30, chapter 4 verse 30, both say that a Christian is sealed and promised eternal life. So if you're a post-tribber, which one is it? 
Number three, the origin of the post-trib pre-wrath rapture teaching. All right, I'm going to read here very quickly from the very first book in print on this subject. Right there it is. By Marvin Rosenthal. Kind of funny, he's a Jew. And yet some of these people like uh, <coughs> Stephen Anderson, <coughs> excuse me, um, is anti-Jewish, anti-Semitic. And yet he gets his teachings from a Jew. Interesting. Page 265, chapter 19. Right here it is. You can pause it. Read it. Says the pre-wrath rapture. Why this view now? Perhaps at this point an important question must be answered. If the thesis of this book is correct, if the church is to be raptured pre-wrath at the opening of the seventh seal and therefore sometime within the second half of the 70th week of Daniel, why has this position never been enunciated before? Why only after more than 1900 years into the church age does this view appear on the scene? Is it simply a new and fanciful position set forth by an extremist? This is a legitimate issue deserving a satisfactory response. You see, this book was copyrighted, and written, in other words, and copyright is 1990. Right there. Very interesting. How about that? And then uh, here's the link to the video. I have a link put in my PDF file here. Here's the link to the video showing these actual quotes from the book. I get showing some of it and I show a few other, another quote from his book. After Rosenthal's book came out in 1990, a man named Roland Rasmussen released a book entitled The Post-Trib Pre-Wrath Rapture in 1996. Right there's the book. I have it. I've read it. These uh, wingnuts that put this stuff out, that promote this kind of stuff, Anderson and his cult, they'll say, oh, the pre-tribbers are afraid of this material. It challenges their position. This doesn't challenge my position at all. It's ridiculous nonsense. Put out in 1996. Problem. Why do these post-trib believers claim that the pre-trib rapture position only dates back to the 1830s with John Nelson Darby? while defending a position which was first written about in the year 1990. How about that? Number four. Fourth problem for post-trib rapture believers. Church purification. Ephesians chapter 5 verses 25 through 32 says, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones." For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. A Christian today is part of the bride of Christ, and also part of Christ's body. Jesus cleanses his church with his written word, the King James Bible, and nourishes and cherishes her. We are one flesh. That's what the passage said in Ephesians chapter 5. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 says, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanseth us from all sin. All sin. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses a Christian today from all sin. I have written here. We have no further need of purification. Yet post-trib believers insist that the church needs to be purified by the Great Tribulation, what they call the Great Tribulation. Where does this teaching come from? Let's take a look at the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Let's do that. Again, I have a copy right here. Page 
page 193, number 675 in the Catechism, the church's ultimate trial. Before Christ's second coming, the church must pass through a final trial that will shake the faith of many believers. The persecution that accompanies her pilgrimage on earth will unveil the mystery of iniquity in the form of a religious deception, offering men an apparent solution to their problems at the price of apostasy from the truth. The supreme religious deception is that of the Antichrist, a pseudo messianism by which man glorifies himself in place of God and of his Messiah come in the flesh. Number 677, skip two, skip 676. I have 66, 675 through 677 in the PDF, but I'm just going to go down to 677. It says here, the church will enter the glory of the kingdom only through the final, this final Passover, which when she follow, when she will follow her Lord in his death and resurrection. Hmm. So the Catholic Church is teaching the need for fur further purification. Interesting. And I've shown this thing in videos numerous times, so I'm not going to bother trying to get it you know, shown here. But you can look it up. And again, the PDF that I have that is written out here, this right here is from the Vatican. I have the, the link right there. You can see the link in the PDF. There's the link to the Vatican's website with all this material right here. Directly, this is copied and pasted from the Vatican's own website. All right. The Catholic Church has taught for centuries that the death of Jesus Christ on the cross was not enough to completely pay for sins. A faithful Catholic needs further purification through penance, keeping the sacraments, and good works. The Catholic must die in a state of grace, which is what they teach, and then go through more purification in purgatory before entering heaven. Here's the problem. Why do post-tribbers believe that the church needs to be purified by the Great Tribulation? Why do they agree with the Catholic Catechism and not with the King James Bible? King James Bible says you're pure through the blood of Jesus Christ. All your sins are washed away through the blood of Jesus Christ. The Catechism says, no, you need more purification. You need works. Die in a state of grace. And then you get more purification after that. Funny that the uh, post-tribbers uh, will line up with that teaching. Number five, the Great Tribulation, quote-unquote, or the time of Jacob's trouble. Look at this, Jeremiah chapter 30, verses 4 through 7. And these are the words that the Lord spake concerning Israel and concerning Judah. Very clear who this is to. For thus saith the Lord, We have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. Ask ye now, and see whether a man doth travail with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins, as a woman in travail, and all faces turned into paleness? Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. The nation of Israel and the Jewish people have rejected Jesus Christ as their Messiah, so they will be entering into a time of God's wrath and judgment. Let's look, also look at Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9, verse 20 through 24 says, And whilst I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, Daniel writing here, and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, yea, whilst I was speaking in, in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being called to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore understand the matter and consider the vision. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Again, we can clearly see that this time period is going to be for the nation of Israel. Verse 24 also includes the words, Thy holy city, which is obviously a reference to the city of Jerusalem. Yeah. The post-tribbers use the terms the tribulation or the great tribulation to refer to this coming time period. The problem is that nowhere in the King James Bible are either of these phrases used as a unique title for the time of Jacob's trouble. 
Not one time. Never. And they'll quote Matthew chapter 24, I think it's verse 20, and they'll say, immediately after the tribulation, and they stop right there. They're literally subtracting from God's word when they do that. They're not quoting the whole verse. Because they're not saying, it's just the first part of the verse, whatever they, they tell you, this is what the Bible teaches. They'll quote just a part of the scripture and leave the rest out. That's satanic when you do that. Problem. Here's the problem. Why are post-tribbers trying to cover up Jeremiah 30 and Daniel 9, and instead they are using a phrase, the tribulation, which is never used as a title for this coming time period? Hmm. Kind of weird. Number seven, problem number seven for post-trib rapture believers, the resurrection of dead saints. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 through 52 says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 16 through 18 says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. There is no mention of dead saints being resurrected in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 17, and chapter 21 of Luke. All post-tribbers must go to the gospel accounts to try and prove that the body of Christ goes through the, what they call the tribulation. They claim that the resurrection of dead saints wasn't revealed until Paul. That's how they get around this thing. Let's look at what Jesus said in the book of John and see how it lines up with 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. John chapter 11 verse 24, Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Talking about Lazarus. Look what Jesus says, verse 25 through 27. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. Now here's the problem for post-tribbers. The resurrection of the dead was clearly revealed by Jesus to his disciples before it was shown to the Apostle Paul. So why didn't Jesus mention the dead being resurrected in Matthew 24, Mark 13, or Luke 17, or chapter 21? Hmm? Interesting. Number eight. The eighth problem. Two bodies or one body. Revelation chapter 7, verse 4. And I heard the number of them that which were sealed, and there were sealed in hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Jews. Revelation 7, verse 9. And after this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Post-trib pre-wrath believers will claim that this is the body of Christ in heaven after the rapture happens in chapter 6 of Revelation. I know your system, I know what you believe. But here's the big problem with that theory. Look at what the book of Galatians has to say about Jewish and Greek Christians. Galatians 3.28 there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. Problem. Why are saints in the time of Jacob's trouble separated into two distinct racial groups when the Bible clearly says that the body of Christ is one group? That's a problem if you're a post trib rapture believer. Number nine, two thirds saved. A Christian is composed of a spirit and soul and body, according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. Look it up. At salvation, the soul is saved, James 5, 20, and the spirit is quickened, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. The body of flesh remains corruptible. You can read Romans chapter 7, verse 14 through 25, if you want proof on that. And is not redeemed until the catching away of the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 35 through 58 talks about the corruptible. Must put on incorruption. Our flesh is corruptible. So the question is, when will the catching away and changing of our bodies happen? That's the question. Romans 
And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. We're waiting for that to happen. Hmm. Romans 13, verse 11. And that knowing the time that now it is high time to wake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 9 through 10. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Problem for the post-tribbers. Post-tribbers are waiting to see the Antichrist. Prophetically speaking, that's who they're looking for. That's the next man to show up. And they're not looking for Jesus to show up first. That'd be pre-trib rapture. They're looking for Jesus to show up after the Antichrist. They teach against an imminent catching away of the bride of Christ. Yet the three passages which we read all clearly show that a Christian is to look for Jesus Christ and the redemption of their body. And Paul wrote there in Romans 13, Now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. What salvation is he talking about? Corruptible putting on incorruption. Then we will be completely saved. My soul is saved. My spirit is redeemed. My body is still corruptible. My spirit is quickened. Say it that way. Number 10. The 10th problem for post-trib rapture believers. Subject to principalities and powers. Here's another good one. Titus chapter 3 verses 1 and 2. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers to obey magistrates, to be, made, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1-4 through 4 says, I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Revelation chapter 13, verse 4 through 7. And they worshiped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Problem. Paul tells Christians to be subject unto political powers and also to pray for them and to be thankful for them. But how is this possible if Christians go into the time of Jacob's trouble, like all post-tribbers teach? Wouldn't this force Christians to take the mark of the beast? Read Revelation chapter 13, verses 16 through 18. All are caused, causeth all, to take the mark and to worship the beast in his image. We're to be subject to the powers and principalities. How does that work if you're a post-tribber? like to hear your explanation on that one. Problem number 11. Separated from God's love. Romans chapter 8, verses 35 through 39 says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, For thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Problem, if you're a post-tribber. If Christians go through the time of Jacob's trouble, then, quote-unquote, tribulation will certainly separate them from the love of Christ, because it is Jesus Christ who is opening the seals of Revelation chapter 6. Yeah. And what if a Christian submits to the Antichrist, in other words, the powers there, powers given to him, and takes the mark of the beast? Revelation 14, verses 9 through 11, clearly shows that this 
that doing this will separate any man from God's love. So what do you do with that? How do you reconcile this stuff? Number 12, what is stopping the Antichrist from appearing? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 through 10. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? And that's where most post-tribbers will stop. They won't keep reading the verses there, because it debunks their system. But we are going to keep reading. Verse 6, And now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Speaking about the body of Christ there being taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Problem for the post-tribbers. Post-tribbers will only read to verse 5 and then try to claim that the text is teaching that the Antichrist must be revealed before the rapture. Why do they refuse to continue reading the next five verses? Because, you see, the next five verses show that something is withholding the Antichrist, letting, hindering him, in other words, from showing up. And that whatever that is that's hindering the Antichrist from showing up must be revealed, or excuse me, removed before the Antichrist can be revealed. That's why posties don't like to read those verses. Conclusion. Number one. The post-trib rapture system is based on a twisting of Scripture. Absolutely, they refuse to rightly divide the word of truth. They'll claim that they do. They're lying. Number two, post-trib rapture believers are teaching works salvation every single time. Every single time of it. You want proof? Okay, I'll give you proof. I'm a Christian. We're going to go into the time of Jacob's trouble. I'm going to take the mark of the beast because I have to provide for my family according to 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. I have to provide for my family, so I'm going to take the mark. But I don't have to worry because I'm eternally secure. Posties, am I going to be making it to heaven? You see? Well, no, you can't. Then it's works. I can't just get to heaven by uh, my belief and faith and things like that. No, there's things I'd have to do. That's why these posties will talk about, I'm just worried about pre-trib rapture believers. What's going to happen to them? If we're eternally secure, what are you worried about? There's nothing that can happen to us to make us lose our salvation. Number three. Most post-tribbers are not preparing to survive the time of Jacob's trouble. That's another thing that's very funny. They believe that they're going to go into this time period and they just say, God's going to provide. God will provide. Show me that in Scripture. God's wrath God's judgment is just being poured out the whole time, including chapter 6. It's Jesus Christ that's opening those seals and bringing judgment on the earth. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. Unless you're a post-tribber, because you believe that you're going into a time when the Lamb of God Jesus Christ opens a seal and peace is taken from the earth. You better think about that. So I'm going to encourage all my brethren out there. You now have a written 12 post-trib rapture problems here. Seven pages in length. I didn't plan it that way. It came out that way. Seven pages in length. Scriptures typed out. All the arguments that you want. Any post tribber that comes along and tries to shake your faith in the pre trib rapture, write to the website, get this, and post it as a reply. Or give them the link to the website, right there it is. I'm not making any money off of this. Totally free, PDF available. All right? You see some videos where they're spewing this heretical nonsense that the body of Christ is going to go into a time of God's judgment and wrath. You know, they're out there teaching this post trib nonsense. Right there you go. They can't answer these points right here. They can't answer them. And they know it. 
So that is going to be it. Thank you very much for watching.